Bible says in Matthew chapter number 8. We'll pick up the story in verse number 23. Matthew 8, 23. Into a ship, his disciples followed him. By the way, that's good advice right there. His disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? What an amazing story. Just like the withered hand that he was able to make whole instantaneously, here in this story, he shows his power, shows his authority, even over the wind and nature itself. It's always interesting when you look at a miracle or an account of any kind in the Gospels where it's recorded in multiple uh, accounts of the, of the Gospel narrative. You look at multiple aspects of it, and you'll see different things that you might not see otherwise. For instance, notice that the Bible says in verse 26, it says, He saith in uh, verse 25, the disciples came, awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. Verse 26 says that Jesus said, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? And then it says, Then he arose. See, we in our mind, we always think he stood up first and rebuked the wind and the sea. It's actually not what the Bible says. What the Bible says is he rebuked them first and then he arose. Anybody ever wake you up in the middle of sleeping and you just talk to them from the side, right? That's kind of what happened here, right? They, they, they were scared. The, the wind was raging. The sea was storming. And, and they go and they, they wake him up. And as he's laying down, maybe on his side, maybe on his back, maybe he just woke up and you like that irritated look you get when you just open your eyes and you notice your kids, right? And, and, and he, he's, the Bible says he rebuked them first. And then it says he arose and rebuked the storm. Turn over in your Bible to Mark chapter 4. Chapter number four. This is a parallel passage to what we just read in Matthew chapter eight. And in Mark chapter four, we're going to see a different perspective, Mark's perspective. Mark was not an apostle, he was not one of the 12 disciples. He was probably trained by Peter. And so this is probably to some degree Peter's version of what happened, but either way, it's still inspired scripture. It's still in the text. And so this is another perspective, the same perspective, but a uh, little less information in some areas and a little bit more information in other areas. And just remember, when you read the gospel accounts and you see differences within the gospel accounts, remember the one thing, those are not contradictory accounts. Those are complementary accounts. That's additional info that's given in one gospel that may not be given in another gospel. And so let's look at Mark's account, this complementary account that fits, within the, that fits the narrative of the Matthew 8 account that we just read. The Bible says in Mark chapter number 4, verse number 35, it says, In the same day, when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was, in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, that's the tempest that Matthew spoke of. And the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and uh, said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Notice a couple of things here. Notice here in this account, he rebukes the apostles after he rebukes the sea. Did you notice that? In verse, 20, uh, verse 38, he was, a, he was in the hinder part of, a, part of the ship asleep on a pillow. They awake him and said, Master, carest thou carest thou not that we perish, he arose and rebuked the wind. And so what we have is when we put these gospel accounts together, what we see is the clearer picture is that when they woke him up, he rebuked them, he gets up, he rebukes the sea, and then he rebukes them one more time, just for good measure. And so he rebukes the men, he rebukes the wind, he rebukes the men again. 
And so that's just one of those little nuggets that you don't notice if you're just reading through the Gospels. Uh, when you study your scriptures, you should at times, especially when there's, multi, when there's stories that are recorded in multiple places, compare them, put them together, and you'll get a, big, a bigger, greater picture of what really happened. I want to preach this morning out of this text in, in Mark chapter 4, and I want to preach on three things that you see in this text. I want you, I want you to see the presence of Jesus... I want you to see the peace of Jesus, and I want you to see the patience of Jesus. First of all, notice the presence of Jesus. The Bible says in verse 35, And the same day, uh, when, the, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when, uh, when they had sent the multitude away, notice this phrase, They took him even as he was into the ship. Notice, they took him as he was. They didn't try to change him. They didn't try to make him fit some narrative that he was not. They took Jesus as he was. It is an interesting thought in and of itself that the creator of all was even interested in coming on board Peter's little boat. Now, I don't know if this was Peter's boat here. What I do know is the Bible says one time Peter, uh, Jesus entered into Peter's house. And I, another time the Bible says Jesus entered into Peter's boat. And so... Uh, it, it seems to me that this might have been Peter's boat, although the text doesn't say that. It was somebody's boat. And here's the thought. Why would the creator of all that created the oceans be concerned about some little boat? He was interested in being where his disciples were. He was interested in having that relationship with his disciples. Peter might have owned the boat, but Jesus made the sea. And there's a big difference in Jesus' ability and those seasoned professional fishermen's ability, and yet Jesus was still interested in them. And it's an interesting thing that Jesus was interested in going on that little ship. He's also interested in coming into our little ship and our lives, the vessels that we call our lives. He's interested in, in being with us. He's interested in being with us as we sail through the seas of life. You see, Jesus Christ desires to come on board our ship. He wants to be that close and personal Savior that the Bible puts him forth to be. He is not some sort of far-off distant being. He wants a close and a personal relationship. But if we don't invite him, he's not coming on board. He is a complete gentleman. If you want to reject him off of your ship, you don't want his presence, he is not okay with that, but he will abide by that. He will not force himself into your life. But if we do decide to invite him on board, we must do what these men do. We must take him as he is. You see, we don't want Jesus to be anything other than as he is. We think that he want, we want him to be something different, but in the end, we don't. We want to take Jesus as he is. We don't take him as we want him to be. You see, we don't take Jesus and make him into the soft and weak male that some religions and some people make him to be. We don't make Jesus into the soft and weak male that some with the spiritual gift of mercy make him to be. He is the strong and powerful creator. We must take him as he is. Think about this. Even in his physical life, Jesus was not a weak man. How many physically weak carpenters have you ever met in your life? Ever. Jesus was a carpenter for 20 years. I met a carpenter last week. I literally have never met a carpenter that doesn't have hands that are like 18 inches wide and just fat and just able to, you know, turn wrenches and, and carve things. They're strong. Jesus was a carpenter for 20 years. Even in life, he would have been a strong man. His hands would have been calloused. His forearms and shoulders would have been strong. He, Jesus is not the weak, frail man that some religions and people make him to be. But Jesus is also not the harsh and cruel slave driver that some religions and people make him to be. Jesus is not the harsh and cruel slave driver that some with the spiritual gift of prophecy or the gift of ruling make him out to be. You must take Jesus as he is. Jesus is the most kind-hearted and gentle man that has ever walked the face of the earth. He, is, he was physically powerful on earth. He is physically powerful, uh, spiritually powerful today in heaven. But he is also kind, gentle-hearted more than any man that's ever lived. 
You see, Jesus is not weak because he also has the highest standards of excellence for your potential for anybody that has ever lived. John chapter 1, in fact, says of Jesus that he is full of grace and truth. What that phrase means is he is a perfect balance of everything that we need. We need some people to be truthful to us. We need others to be graceful to us. We need that perfect balance. And whatever that balance is, Jesus Christ is fully and completely balanced in who he is. He is holy, but he is also gracious. He is righteous, but he is also merciful. You must take Jesus as he is. Is. We're talking about his presence, taking Jesus with his presence. Did you get into his presence this morning? You see, you must take him as he is. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11 that he wants us to learn of him. You cannot learn of Jesus Christ outside this book. Understand, you can know that God exists away from this book. You do not need the Bible to know that God exists. You have your conscience that has the Ten Commandments written on it, that point you to God. You have creation that points you to God. You do not need the Bible to know intellectually that God exists, but you do need to know the Bible to learn of Him. You do need the Bible to take Him as He is. You do not know Jesus outside this book. You can know intellectually that God exists. You will not know who He is personally outside this book. You will have a slanted, <clears throat> a tainted version of who God is if you are not in this book. How can you learn of him if you have not been in his presence in his book? I, I, we would be embarrassed if we took a poll this morning of people that got ready on their outward appearance this morning and cared nothing about their inward heart. We would be embarrassed of the women that had their makeup on just right and their hair just right and you didn't bow your knee. You didn't talk to the Lord. We would be embarrassed of the men with their suit and their tie and their good looks. And you didn't talk to the Lord. We would be embarrassed of the teachers that stood and taught children last hour. And you didn't get taught this morning by the word of God. You didn't get in his presence. These men wanted the presence of God. And they wanted the presence of God as he was. We must take him as he is. Did you get in his presence this morning? Did you learn of him? Why do we need to take him as he is? It's actually very simple. Because he's not going to change for you. You take him as he is, or you don't take him at all. He will not change for you. He is loving, and you are not. He is kind, and you are not. He is calm and you are not. He is wise, and you are not. He is strong, you are not. He is holy, you are not. You take him as he is. He's not going to change for you. Amen. But hear me. He will change you. You see, you take Jesus as he is, someone's got to change. And it ain't Jesus. He will not change for you. But you take him as he is, and he'll change you. You don't know him without the knowledge of Scripture. You, people think that they have taken Jesus as he is. Somebody that thinks that they've taken Jesus as he is and they don't know the Bible, they are literally committing idolatry. Outside of the Bible, if some person says, yeah, I know Jesus, I know God, I know the Lord, and if they don't know the Bible, they have manufactured, they have made up, they have created an image of God in their head that they like, and then they worship that. That is idolatry. You take Jesus as he is, <clears throat> or you don't take him at all. Amen. It is truly that simple. And these men knew that. They took Jesus as he was. Listen to me. They didn't take the Baptist Jesus. Amen. They took Jesus. Amen. They didn't take the Catholic Jesus. They took Jesus. They didn't take the Mormon Jesus. They didn't take the Methodist Jesus. They took the Bible Jesus as he was. And that is who you must take. Get into his presence. Get into the presence of Jesus as he is. Please hear me. Take him as he is or don't take him at all. Number one, the presence of Jesus. Number two, the peace of Jesus. <clears throat> Notice what the Bible says in verse number 37. And there arose a great storm of wind 
And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship. Watch this phrase. Asleep on a pillow. Let me ask you a question. Show of hands. Who has accidentally fallen asleep on the couch watching TV or something, reading a book? Raise your hands. Okay. You've accidentally fallen asleep. Guess what you never do? You never accidentally fall asleep on a pillow. Right? When you're on a pillow, you fall asleep on purpose. Right? You might accidentally fall asleep on a couch. You might accidentally, listen, all right, some of us, who's falling asleep driving? You've kind of dazed, oh, 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 the rest of you, you're all lying. All right, you can accidentally fall asleep a lot of places. You don't ever accidentally fall asleep on a pillow. So his head is on a pillow. He went to sleep on purpose. He was supposed to be sleeping. The apostles, they were worried. They were fretting, not him. He had peace in his heart. He had peace with God. This storm was a torrential downpour. The, downpour. the Bible calls it a tempest. That's tempestuous. This is a terrible storm. And Jesus Christ purposefully goes to sleep, <coughs> think about it, in the middle of their storm. By the way, this sleeping Jesus didn't mean that he had given up control of the universe. No, no, this sleeping Jesus simply, you see a glimpse into his humanity. Remember, Jesus Christ was not 50% God, 50% man. It's not who he was. He was 100% God, clothed in 100% flesh. He was 100% God, 100% man. He is the God-man. And here you see his humanity as he sleeps. In fact, this is the only time in the Bible that you'll see him sleeping. And so Jesus is woken up. The Bible says in verse uh, 38, he's sleeping, uh, he's sleeping on the hinder part of the ship, sleep on the pillow. They awake him saying, Master, carest thou not that we perish? I mean, that, that's kind of a... We do this. I, I, I'm, I'm criticizing these guys, but we do this. Think about that question. Jesus, do you care that I perish? Like, you, no, I don't care that you die, Andrew. No, you're good. No, Peter, you can just die. You're, I, I don't. Of course he cared. He, notice he doesn't, even, right, he doesn't even acknowledge the question. He doesn't even answer it because he knows how foolish it is. He doesn't challenge them on it. But notice he doesn't even address the question. They say, cares them not that we perish. Verse 39, he arose rebuked the wind. Remember, we learned from Matthew 8 that he rebuked them first, then the wind, and then the Bible says, and he said unto the sea, peace be still. Now, I can't imagine this. Uh, we were down in Lake Cumberland, uh, I don't know, a number of years ago, and I was out on the back deck of the house that we were at, and reading my Bible and praying, and nobody had been on the lake yet. It was probably 6.30 or 7 in the morning. I'm not really sure when. But where we were, there was not a single ripple on the lake. It was literally a sheet of glass. You could see the reflection of the trees in the lake perfectly. I mean, that was completely calm. I don't know if this went that calm, but can you imagine the raging tempest of this sea, the waves beating into the boat? Listen, have you ever gotten knocked down by a wave? They're powerful. They're unpredictable. You don't know which direction they're coming from. These professional seasoned fishermen would have been physically knocked down by this water. And all of a sudden, Jesus, think about it, on the puff of peace, that water went calm. The moment he said, peace, be still. There was an immediate calm over the entire sea. But I'm not drawn to the power that he has in controlling the ocean. I'm drawn to his sleeping. You see, this is not the first time that a preacher was caught sleeping in a ship in the middle of a storm. And yet here's Jesus sleeping, a preacher sleeping in the middle of a storm. There was a preacher in the Old Testament that actually did the same exact thing. Nearly every Old Testament prophet that was sent somewhere, was sent someplace in Judah or in Israel. God sent his prophets to, to preach to his people. Jonah, though, was the first prophet ever sent out of Israel. You see, God was interested in reaching and getting his message, God's message to God's people, so he sent his prophets to Judah. <coughs> he sent his prophets to Israel. Jonah, though, was the first prophet that went out of the nation. He was literally a traveling missionary. He went to Assyria. And so what we learn by that is God is interested in getting God's message to God's people, but God is also interested in getting God's message to God's enemies. And that's who Assyria was. It was one of God's enemies, and Jonah knew that. Jonah hated Assyria. He hated Nineveh, hated them. And because Jonah didn't like the calling on Jonah's life, he fought it. He ran from it. 
By the way, it's never a good thing to fight and run from the calling that God has placed on your life. Jonah fought God's calling and convinced himself that he was okay. The Bible says that Jonah went down to Joppa and found a ship. The Bible says that Jonah went down into the ship. And that's very, very, uh, 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 that's a telling word where when you run from God, when you run from his presence, when you run from his will, you are in fact headed down. But the Bible doesn't stop there. <coughs> the Bible says that after Jonah went down into the ship, the Bible says he paid the fare thereof. You see, when you go your own way, you'll pay for it. You will pay for it. Go your own way for six months, six years, six decades. You'll pay for it. Your children will pay. Go your own way. You'll pay the fare thereof. Jonah runs from God. He finds a boat. He falls asleep in the boat. Jonah does. And you probably know the story. The storm comes up, this tempest and and, and, and the shipmaster comes to Jonah and says, Awake thou sleeper and call upon thy God. So think about it. It's just interesting about Jonah and Jesus that both got caught in a terrible storm. Both fell asleep in the midst of a storm. Both were woken up by the ship's shipmaster. Hear me. Please hear me. They both had peace in the midst of the storm. I think you would agree with me. Jesus was peaceful enough to sleep in the midst of the storm. <coughs> Jonah was peaceful enough to sleep in the midst of the storm. They had peace, but listen to me. There was a vast difference between the peace that Jesus had sleeping in the boat in the midst of the storm and the peace that Jonah had sleeping in the boat in the midst of the storm. They both had peace, but Jonah's peace was a false peace from his flesh that convinced him that he was okay. Jesus' peace was a true peace from his spirit that convinced him that he was okay. They both thought that they were okay, but only one was correct. Jesus had a true peace. Jonah had a false peace. And so what I'm drawn to, after the presence of Jesus, I'm drawn to the peace of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. <coughs> Do you have peace in your life today? Do you have peace from God, or do you have a false peace? Thank you, Brother Darren. Man, everybody coming up. Brother Mike came up. Brother Josh came up. Now, Brother Darren. Appreciate that, sir. And I spilled water on myself. That's fantastic. Jeremy will make fun of me later. Do you have peace with God? You see, there's a difference between false peace and true peace. Jonah had peace, but it was a false peace. Jesus had peace. It was a true peace. There's a vast difference between true peace and false peace. Here's the problem. <coughs> they feel identical. You actually don't know the difference. How many times have you heard somebody say something to the effect of, I have peace about this? And I always think to myself, so? Literally, well, I'm going to do this. I have peace about it. So what does peace have to do with anything? Jonah had peace, and he was absolutely wrong. I want you to think about this. Jonah's rebellion gave him peace. Your rebellion will give you peace. You will convince yourself that you're in the right when you are completely going against God's word. Well, I have peace about it. Who cares if you have peace? Jo Listen, you woke Jonah up and asked him, Jonah... Are you thinking clearly? Talk to me, church. What would Jonah have said? Jonah, are you thinking clearly? What would Jonah have said? Yeah, I'm good. He wasn't good. He had a false peace from his flesh that was not of God. It was of the devil. It was of the world. It was of his flesh. You wake up, Jesus, Jesus, are you thinking clearly? Yeah, I'm thinking clearly. And you immediately think, yep, he is thinking clearly. False peace, real peace. <clears throat> they feel exactly the same. Here's the difference. Jonah's rebellion gave him peace, and Jesus' submission gave him peace. Amen. Which one do you have? In your heart right now, is there a spark of rebellion? Is there a desire for submission? Remember the difference between submission and obedience. Obedience is obeying outwardly. Submission is obeying inwardly. Submission is actually an issue of the heart. You can obey your parents without submitting to them. You can obey outwardly without submitting to them. Obedience is outward, submission is inward. Rebellion is also inward. 
So my question to you this morning, the peace that you say you have, is it from rebellion or is it from submission? The way to tell is to go back to the book. Remember what, Jonah, remember what the Bible says in Jonah. The Bible says in, in the book of Jonah, the word of the Lord came to him. And so when Jonah was in rebellion to what the word of the Lord was, it did not matter what peace he said that he had, he was wrong. And it does not matter what you think you are doing. If you are in contradiction to this book, I do not care what peace you think you have. It and you are wrong. When I am in contradiction to this book, me and my peace are irrelevant. They don't matter. This trumps everything. That is the peace that Jesus had. He did not have a false peace. He had a true peace. And, and, and you sort of know this. Watch. Have you ever just felt good after you gave somebody a piece of your mind? It feels good. You, like, I say that because all of us know that feeling. What is that? That's a false peace. Well, they needed it. No, not from you. Not from me. That's a false peace. Well, that felt good. Yeah, that's a false peace. Every one of us know that feeling. So I'm struck by the presence of Jesus. I'm struck by the peace of Jesus. Number three, <coughs> I'm struck by the patience of Jesus. Notice what the Bible says in Mark chapter 4. The Bible says in verse 37, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship. Watch this. So that it was now full. You know what that word now means? It means there was a time when it wasn't full. There was a time when it was just a little bit of water. There was a time when the water was up to the ankles. There was a time when the water was up to the shins. There was a time when the water was up to the knees. But now it was now full. Matthew says that the ship was covered in waves. Here the Bible says that the ship was full. Listen, this storm, <coughs> coincidentally, that had the presence of Jesus on it, that had the peace of Jesus in it, <coughs> now we're going to see the patience of Jesus. These apostles were exactly where they were supposed to be. They were in God's will, and yet this storm is still devouring them. And through this, I want you to see the patience of Jesus. Storms are an interesting thing. Sometimes storms in our lives come because of our godliness. We're in God's will. Other times storms come into our life because of our ungodliness. We're outside of God's will. And you can see this in the Bible. You look at Joseph in the Old Testament. Storms came into his life because of his godliness. His brother, Judah, storms came into his life because of his ungodliness. You look at Daniel. Storms came into Daniel's life because of his godliness. You look at Joseph. I'm sorry, um, David. Storms came into David's life because of his ungodliness. Storms come into our lives at times because of our godliness. We're in God's will, sometimes because of our ungodliness, but they're storms nonetheless. So here, these men are in God's will. They're in God's presence. They're next to God's peace, and yet the storm is still there. Which means that the presence of God in your life and the peace of God in your life don't stop the storms from raging. Sometimes the enemy will do his best to stir up a storm in your life when you choose to put Jesus first. Amen. When you get into God's presence, when you get God's peace, sometimes it is then that Satan says, okay, now comes the storm. And that is what seems to happen here. Listen, Jesus never promised protection from the storm. <coughs> he does promise his presence in the storm. He does promise his peace in the storm. By the way, as bad as these guys had it, <coughs> notice verse 36, the last phrase. They were also with him other little ships. As bad as these guys had it with Jesus' presence, with the peace of Jesus, imagine how bad the other ships were. They didn't have Jesus. Listen, you, you, you see people every day of your life. They go through the same stuff you do, and those are other little ships that don't have Jesus. Think about how bad, think about how bad you cling to the Lord sometimes. And don't know what to do next. Think about those other little ships out there without the presence of God, without the peace of God. And you think to yourself, how do they survive? 
How are they not sunk? By the way, this ship should have sunk. This ship, the Bible says, was covered. This ship, the Bible says, was now full. Listen, I'm not a sailor. I don't know much. But one thing I know about ships, when they're full, they don't float. When they, they're full, they sink. Boats and ships are designed to be on the water, navigate through the water. They're not designed to hold water. I don't care if it's as big as the Titanic. When a ship holds enough water, if it's full, it's sinking. But because the master of the seas was on this ship, it didn't sink. Even Satan couldn't sink this ship. The creator of water was on this ship. It was not going down. But I am drawn to the fact that it was now full. Which means the apostles had time to come to Jesus. And you know what they did? They did the same thing that you and I do. They waited to the last minute. They waited to the last minute to come to Jesus. Peter and Andrew and James and John, they're professional fishermen. Legitimately professionals in their craft. They had been on the sea hundreds of times. Probably had been in dozens of storms. Maybe not quite like this. They knew what to do though. They're beat with the waves and the water's up to their ankles. And Peter says, we're good. Nathaniel's in the back saying, man, wake up Jesus. Thomas, uh, Thomas says, man, wake up the Lord. James and John and, and Andrew, the real fish, they're like, no, we got this. We got this. And they waited until the absolute last minute to wake up Jesus. You could hear them arguing as Nathaniel and Thomas and some of these other men that were not fishermen wanted to wake up the Lord. And Peter, who was the leader of, his, of the uh, apostles, uh, he didn't want to. He thought he could handle it. He thought he could handle the storm that was in front of him. What he did not know is that he could not handle the storm without the Lord. They finally wake him up. And they thought they could handle the storms in their lives, which is why it took them so long to wake up Jesus. Think about this. Why does it take us so long to wake up Jesus? The moment that the storm came up, they should have woke up the Lord. They should have woke up the master of the sea the moment the water was at their ankles. They should have woke up the master of the sea when the water was at their shins. But they didn't. They waited and waited and waited and waited until it was almost too late. And when everything else failed, they said, well, let's see if God can help. They did what Jarius did with his 12-year-old daughter. She was at the point of death. He knew that she was about to die. He had already planned the funeral. Family were there. Musicians were there. He knew she was dying. And in the last moment, Jarius says, well, let's see if Jesus can do anything. The woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, she waits to the last moment. Let's see if Jesus can help. The apostles, oh, the storms of my life, I think I could fix it. I think I can handle it. I'm a fisherman. I'm Peter. I'm James. I'm Andrew. I'm John. They can do nothing against this storm. Probably a demonically inspired storm. They could do nothing. They were weak, frail men. And in the end, at the last moment, they said, well, let's see if Jesus can help. I cannot tell you how many parents I've seen do this through the year. Amen. They bring a kid to the youth group. Well, you know, the ball club didn't help. Boy Scouts didn't help. The school, clubs at school couldn't help. Maybe the youth group can help. And they are, in effect, saying, can Jesus help I've tried everything else for the storms in my kid's life. Maybe Jesus can help. We get that mentality from our human nature. You see that in these good men here. Here's what I'm saying. Stop waiting till the storms are full in your life. Run to Jesus now. They thought they could handle it, but they couldn't. They, think about it. They couldn't handle the storm that was in their life when it was in God's will, when Jesus was there let alone the storms that come into our lives when we're running away from Jesus like Jonah did. They couldn't handle the storm that was a part of God's will for their life, let alone the storms that come into our lives because of the poor choices of us or others. Today, have you reached out to the Lord for the storms in your life? Today, not are you going to, today, have you reached over and woken up the Lord for help? I know he doesn't sleep any longer. I know he's in the spirit. But understand, spiritually speaking, have you reached over, touched the Lord, and said, Lord, I need you? You see, some of you need to reach over and wake up the Lord and ask him to save you. Please hear me. Please hear me. I'm going to say this very kind and graciously. Some of you, if you died today, you're going to hell. You are going to hell. 
And you need to reach over, wake up Jesus and say, Lord, save me. I perish. Reach over, Lord, carest thou not that I perish. And reach out by faith and get your sins under the blood. Listen, there is a fountain filled with blood. And he wants to cleanse your sins of that. You need to reach over and get your sins under that blood. Reach over and wake up the Lord. Others of you, you have storms in your everyday life, and it's just a part of God's will for your life. And, and, and you're fighting in your flesh. And you're trying to do your best, but you're weak and you're frail. You're running out of gas because you haven't reached over and woken up the Lord. You haven't reached over and said, Lord, carest thou not that we perish. Lord, I know that you're, uh, I'm in your presence and I want your peace, but Lord, please help me. And then others of you, you, you have storms in your life that you have brought in that are outside of God's will. Your decisions or the decisions of somebody close to you have brought in storms into your life. You too need to reach over. Listen, you're not, think about this. This was Peter, James, John, and Andrew, four legit professional fishermen, and they couldn't handle a storm that was in God's will for their life. You think you can? There's no way. They are frail men. You and I are frail men and women. Reach over whether the storm is for salvation, the storm is because of God's will, or because the storm is outside of God's will that you've brought into your own life. Reach out and wake up the Lord. That's where his patience is. We talked about the patience of Jesus, the peace of Jesus, and the patience of Jesus. The patience is because even when they waited to the last minute, what did he do? He helped them. He didn't say, no, I'm not going to be your last resort. You fix it yourself. He didn't do that. He was kind. He, was, he rebuked them. He rebuked them twice. He rebuked them before he even got up. Then he fixed the storm. And then he rebuked them again. But he still helped them. And that's what he will do for you. He stands there waiting for you to wake him up. Waiting for you to reach out to him so that he can help. He's not going to take your storm away but he will fix you in the midst, in the presence of your storm. Amen. Father, thank you so much for all that you've done for us, all the blessings in our lives. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the fact that we can get into his presence, and from his presence we can get his peace. And Lord, in his peace, Lord, we can ultimately get his patience for the storms in our lives. And Lord, I pray for this invitation this morning. I pray that those who are not saved would get saved, that they would reach over and wake up Jesus and ask for salvation. Lord, those who are going through storms in their lives because of your will or storms in their lives because they've gone against your will. Lord, I pray that they would reach over and wake you up. Lord, thank you so much for being willing and able and powerful enough to help fix us, correct us, but also calm the storms. Lord, thank you so much for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stand for a moment of invitation. Our men will be down here. If you need to do business with the Lord, you do that this morning.